question for you guys today. And this question is, have any of you ever been in a situation where you've seen an accident about to happen, or maybe you see someone about to trip or fall, and you just have that like inside of you, that moment of like, <gasps> right before it happens, that like, oh, and what do you want to do? You want to be like, watch out, right? Or, wow, what, what's, you know, you just see someone about to either injure themselves, or you just see something about to happen, and inside of you, you get this feeling of just like, <gasps> you just want to help them, right? I remember one time, uh, back in our old church building, we had a very small, small foyer compared to what we have now. Like, probably as big as this stage, if not smaller. It was a hall, yeah. And um, we would all just kind of cram in there. And I remember this little girl, and she like just took off and started heading towards the front doors. And they were just two little glass doors. And she got through. She was barely three years old. And she got through. And if you were in our old building, as soon as you stepped outside the doors, the cars could just drive right there. There was no you know, walkway or sidewalk or anything like that. And this little girl got there. And I remember I just like reached through the door, and I just grabbed her. I was like, watch out. And I, and I said it loud enough to where everyone in that small little foyer just like looked. And the parents were like, oh my gosh, thank you. Oh, have you ever been in a situation like that where you've seen something about to happen? Maybe you've seen a car accident happen. Uh, Dominic and I were in Florida a couple weeks ago, and we saw the craziest, craziest thing. Uh, we were in downtown Sarasota, and there was construction going on. And this van just did this thing. And as soon as they did it, I was like, what are they doing? You know when construction's bad and cars are barely moving and you're in this huge intersection and a car just goes and they stop right in the middle of the intersection and they should have waited because there wasn't room? So this van goes and stops right in the center of the intersection and the light turns red. So the cars wanting to go this way have to go around them. And both sides want to go at the same time because they've been waiting. And literally about eight car wrecks happened in the span of about 10 seconds in front of us. And we were just like, what? Oh, ah! Because like, we could just see it all happening. And so my message today is me on the inside having that feeling of being like, I just see something in the body of Christ. And so this is my message. And it's watch out. This is me saying watch out. And it's about a specific subject. And it's the subject of offense. You know, I've been in the ministry for over 13 years full time, but I've grown up in the ministry. And one thing that I've seen countless times is people get offended, whether it's with people in the body of Christ, in their homes. And this is, this is something that I just feel as a minister on the inside of me. I just get this, oh, watch out. You can, you can see when it's starting to happen. And you just, everything within me just has that feeling of telling that little kid to watch out before they run in front of a car. So my message today is watch out. And we're going to have fun with it today. But at the same time, this is something that affects all of us in here because all of us have relationships, right? You have a relationship with someone, whether it's your parents, your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your friends, your family, your church family. We all have relationships. And the whole purpose of offense is to sever you from those relationships. And so this is something that affects each and every one of us. So I really ask you to keep an open mind and an open heart today as I share these things. And so I'm going to start with a fun story. Uh, unfortunately, Dominic got the opportunity to share this story last time he preached. But I really wanted an opportunity to share my side of this story. So, <laughs> so I get to do that today. And so if you remember this story, if you don't, maybe you didn't hear it, well, you get to hear it today. And this was about a month ago. And it was in the morning, and we're getting ready for the day. And I'm in the closet, and he's in the bedroom. And all of a sudden, he says, oh, hey, by the way, I got invited to go play games at my friend's house. And this is a friend who's invited both of us over a few times to play games. And so it was just the way he said it, something inside of me just kind of went, OK. So I kind of lean over, and I'm like, you were invited? instead of we were invited. And he's like, well, there's just no room for you. <laughs> so ladies, you know what happens on the inside of you as soon as you hear something like, it's starting to simmer, right? The inside of me is starting to be like, hmm, really? OK, because part of me is like, OK, husband. The other part of me is like, really about this friend? Because I like this guy. He's a cool guy. And um, I'm just kind of like, OK. And he's like, well, but you can come and watch if you want. So at that point, you know, the anger meter's like, have you ever seen Inside Out, the cartoon, and there's anger, and he's got his hands on that thing, and he's like wanting to just like shove it forward and just like go off? I, my hands are on the handle at this point. And I'm like, okay. Because on the inside, I'm like, 
absolutely not. I'm not going to go watch you guys have fun and just sit there. What? Like, really? And then he says, well, he already invited the other guys, and so he's kind of already got it set. So at that point, you know, my hands are on the handle of the anger meter, right, ready to just go off on him. But thankfully, I've got someone else on the inside of me that that movie doesn't portray, and that's the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit said, did you hear what he just said? He said, guys. And it was like, so I'm kind of leaning over again, looking at him, I'm like, so is this a guys thing? And he's like, well, yeah. I'm like, okay, babe. Next time you start that conversation, <laughs> you gotta say, hey, honey, my friend's having the guys over to play some games next Sunday. Are you cool with that? Or just wanted to let you know. If he had just started with that, it would have been totally fine. But instead, what happened, I had this opportunity to become very offended at the fact that, first of all, that my husband was willing to just be like, I'm gonna go hang out with these people and forget about you, and then also get offended at this friend who was leaving me out of the party, right? So this is the crazy thing, though. As soon as like, I understood what was going on, do you know, it didn't just leave me like that. It was like half a day where I was still slightly irritated with my husband. <laughs> And it, about the whole situation. And those thoughts came of, well, why, why did they have to make it a guy's thing? They know how much I like to play this game. I've brought the game before to play my Disney version of this game and, and all this. And I'm just telling you, which they did let me do, right, Lucas? They let me play. We played the Disney version, and they all enjoyed it very much. So it was Monopoly, if you're wondering. We have a Disney Monopoly. But anyway, so it just, this whole situation, it bothered me. It was, even though understanding dawned, right? And it was like, oh, okay, this wasn't as big of a deal. Do you know those emotions on the inside of me? It took me a while to get through those. And you know, offense is something that wants to build inside of you. And it's something that if you don't take care of, it's gonna keep building, and it's gonna keep building, and it's gonna keep building until the point that you're gonna sever your divine connections. And when I say divine connections, I mean the people that God has brought into your life that you are supposed to hook up with in this life. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this today. I want you to turn to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Now, um, Blaine last week mentioned this book. And, you know, I believe I remember I went to a, a Christian school and in high school we had Old Testament survey. And I'm pretty sure that our teacher said that back in the day, um, the Jewish men, I believe, had to be 40 before they could read this book because of how descriptive it was between the love for the man and the woman. And so in high school, of course, we just thought this was the funniest book ever um, because we were high schoolers. But my favorite description, because, you know, last week Blaine shared some of the descriptions that, you know, the man says about the woman. My favorite one has always been since high school when he says, your hair is like a flock of goats running down Mount Gilead. You know, as a high schooler, all you can think of is like, what the heck, right? <laughs> what was he thinking? Um, but that was always my favorite definition or description that he used. And there's a lot of crazy ones. But there's something really interesting in Song of Solomon. And we're actually going to read this out of the Passion Translation. Now, this is a popular portion of scripture that I think we've all heard. And it's the scripture that talks about, you know, watch out for the fox that spoil the vine. And I didn't realize, when I was going to go to the scripture, I didn't realize it was in Song of Solomon. For some reason, I thought maybe it was in the New Testament or something. Maybe because I was getting it mixed up with, you know, he's the vine, we are the branches. Uh, but I didn't realize this was in Song of Solomon. And so I wanted to look it up in different translations. And I found the Passion Translation, and I thought this was really interesting. So Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse 15. It says, You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship. For they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. Will you catch them and remove them for me? We will do it together. So what he's talking about here is are little things, sly things, that are going to try to hinder relationships. Well, let me tell you, offense is one of those things. Offense is sly, and I'll take it a step further. It's a trick of the enemy, and its whole purpose is trying to hinder your relationships, your God-given relationships. It says in here, for they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. You know, if you think about this, God has planted things inside of us to be able to give to those around us, to those that we're in relationships with. And if we continue to let these little foxes spoil and disrupt the thing that God's created us to give to one another, 
then we are putting ourselves smack dab in the middle of the enemy's territory. We don't want these little things, these seemingly insignificant little things to affect what God has brought together. And whether it's a marriage or whether it's parents with children, maybe it's you know your church family, your helps team, the people you serve with, uh, people at work, whatever it is, whoever it is, we need to really watch out about this because what offense is, is when we usually see it manifest, it's become this huge thing. But I'm gonna tell you, offense starts with these little things, yeah. these little irritants that we don't get rid of. And so we're gonna talk about today how to look for those things, how to not let those things bother us, and how we can overcome those things. Because at the end of the day, we're children of God, right? We are in this world, but we're not of it, right? We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we're actually going to look at the life of Christ because, you know, he had lots of opportunities to be offended. And we're going to look at what he did and didn't do in his life when those opportunities came his way. I want to read to you the definition of offense. It says, something that outrages the moral or physical senses the state of being insulted or morally outraged. And so the one that I highlighted was the state of being insulted. Now, real quick, before, before I get into this, today the offense I'm talking about, I, I'm not talking about things that um, as Christians um, we can, you know, Jesus was righteously angry at times, right, about things going on around him. There's a righteous anger that I believe as Christians we can have to stand up for the things that are right, to stand up you know, for the lives of unborn children, to stand up for those things right. Um, and things we can see on social media, we may say we take offense to those things. I want you to, to scratch that from your vocabulary. Because we don't need to take offense for those things. What we need to do is we need to stand up for the right things. Because if you uh, if you allow it to be offense, well, you're going to get into kind of the wrong territory. You're not going to want to go down that road. And I've seen a lot of Christians get offended at some of the things going on in the world or, you know, in the political scene or all these things. And I just, I want to tweak our thinking of that a little bit today. It's okay to, to righteously want to stand for what's right. However, if we fall into the thing of offense, you know what we're going to start doing? We're going to start talking bad about people. We're going to start complaining more than praying. And so I really want us to just kind of watch out for those things today, okay? So, so the kind of offense that I'm talking about is the state of being insulted, all right? Have any of you ever been in that state before? Absolutely, right? We've all been there. Why? Because we're human. Um, and we live in a society right now that really promotes this idea that it's okay to be insulted. And not only to be insulted and offended, but then when that happens, that you then have a right to say something or do something to counteract that offense. And that's the world's way of handling things. And I want us to rise above that. You know, we are children of God. We have the Holy Ghost on the inside of us. We don't need to stoop down to that level of immaturity that says, you know, well, when I take offense, what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna then get on social media and I'm gonna say what I have to say about this. Again, difference between standing up for what's right. Can you see that difference? Standing up for what's right, but then at the same time, responding from the flesh out of something that insulted you. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And if we allow it, we could get insulted at every single little thing that we see on social media. In fact, social media, for some reason, has given people this idea that they have a right to just say whatever they want to say whenever they want to say it. Do you know that's not what we should be doing? You maybe have the freedom to do that, but I believe there's a scripture that says, don't let your freedom be an excuse for the flesh. Right. So just because you're free to speak your mind doesn't mean you necessarily need to speak your mind. All right. And also, can I just say this? Can I just step on my little soapbox? A lot of stuff that's on social media is not real and not true, too. Do you know that there's people who get paid to write false stories about things that are happening in the world? Just be wise with that, okay? There's people who get paid lots of money just to put things on there that look a little true, but they're not true, all right? I remember one of the funniest ones I ever saw uh, was, um, it was about another church, um, Elevation Church, and they had a picture of their stage with a swirly water slide and says, Elevation Church installs a water slide for baptisms. And people were sharing this like it was real. And I was like, guys, that's so not real. Stop sharing. Like people get paid money to Photoshop these things and just send them out on social media. So 
Don't get insulted about something that's not even true, for goodness sakes, right? I'm telling you, there's just crazy stuff out there on social media, so don't fall for all the stuff that's on there, all right? And then pray about it. And like I said, just, just watch yourself. Turn to your neighbor and say, watch yourself. Watch yourself, okay? Just watch yourself. Let's, let's be wise in this area, okay? Um, but society really promotes this idea, and so as children of God, as Christians, we need to rise above that. We need to not allow ourselves to fall into that category of, I'm just going to say what I want to say because they offended me. That's not, that is so, I'm going to be honest when I say that's so demonic in the sense that that is the realm of the enemy. To say, oh, they offend me, well, I'm just going to say this then. That, that's the enemy. It, he's all over that. you got to watch yourself, Okay. All right, I'm going to say something here, and you may get offended by it. <laughs> All right? So people don't offend you. You allow yourself to be offended. Right? If you say, oh, that person offended me. No, you allowed yourself to be offended. Because we live in a world where people are going to be rude. And people are going to respond out of their sin nature. Right? And so that's going to happen. So for you to say, oh, that person just offended me. No, you, what you did was you just kind of opened yourself up to show you where you're at spiritually in your maturity level, and you allowed that offense into you. And again, if you would take care of these little things, that big thing won't ever happen, won't ever come up. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. This is not a message maybe our flesh likes to hear, but can I tell you, you know, last week when Blaine was here, he talked about happiness, right? Can I tell you, this is kind of a continuation to a degree of his message because if you can keep yourself from allowing offense in, you are going to be some of the happiest people on this earth. If you can keep yourself from letting people irritate you and get under your skin, right, and keep from those things building on the inside of you, you're going to be pretty happy. You're going to be some of the happiest people in this earth. And so in Romans chapter 12, There's a scripture here that, again, your flesh may not like. You may think you're not able to do this, but you are because you're a child of God. Romans 12, 18 it says, if it is possible, and can I just put this in here? Nothing is impossible, right? So if it's possible, it is possible. As much as depends on who? You. you. Everyone say me. me. Right? As much as depends on me, live peaceably with all men. Notice that this, this does not say as much as depends on the situation. As much as depends on the other person. No, as much as depends on you. You got to take responsibility right here. It is your job to live at peace with other people. It is not circumstances job. It's not other people's job. It's not your spouse's job. It's your job to live at peace with your spouse. It's your job to live at peace with your children. It's your job to live at peace with your coworkers, with your church family, anyone in your realm of living. It is your responsibility to live at peace with them. That's not always the easiest thing to do. Why? Again, we're human, right? We have a flesh. We have a soul. We have a will, right? And sometimes it wants to not live at peace with people. And you may be totally justified in your not wanting to live at peace with someone because of what they have done to you or said about you. But does that matter with God? No. What matters is you are to live peaceably with them. In fact, if we were to keep going in this, it goes on to say, vengeance is whose? It's, it's God's. Right? So even if you are totally justified in wanting to not keep peace with them, your job is to keep peace with them and let God take care of the rest. It's his job to make sure that you come out on top as long as you are doing what he's told you to do. But if you put yourself in the realm of where the enemy works, God can't fix that for you. He can't, he can't, he can't get in there and do what he wants to do to maybe restore that relationship or to help you if you're constantly putting yourself in the devil's territory of staying in that realm of offense. And so we need to make sure that we are living at peace with all men. All right, so just a couple points that I want to talk about here. So the opportunity comes for you to take offense, okay? Again, not somebody offends you. The opportunity comes for you to take offense. So, so what are we supposed to do with that? So the first thing is just like I shared, 
how with Dominic and I, that whole story, I had to do something. Do you know what I had to do? I had to let it go. Everyone say, let it go. Let it go. Everyone sing, let it go. <laughs> all right, let it go. If you don't know what that is, it's from Frozen, all right? <laughs> but probably just about everyone in here knows what that's from. All right, we got to let it go because what happens when that opportunity comes to be offended, we want to hold on to it. And it's like even in that situation with Dominic and I, if I hadn't let it go, maybe that situation it hadn't offended me, but what if I would stored it away for another day when something else tries to come up? What's going to happen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to that and say, oh, and remember that time when he did that too? We have to let these things go. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And so what are some examples of, of an opportunity of offense coming to you? Well, we all could give a handful of those, right? Um, maybe someone's just rude to you in public, right? Um, I had a situation happen one time where there was someone who I was um, very close to as a teenager, someone who I looked up to. And um, down the road, some years later, some offense had gotten in there. And this is years later, and I'm walking down a hallway. And as I'm walking down this hallway, this person's walking towards me. There is no one else in this hallway, right? Uh, we're, just, we're just getting ready to walk by each other. And I haven't seen this person in a while. And things did not end on the best of terms. And as I'm walking down this hallway, I'm like, hi. And the person just goes, just literally, just like that. Now, this is someone I was very close to. You need to understand, I was very close to this person. And they did not even acknowledge my existence in that hallway. And we were the only two people there. Did I have, quote unquote, in the, the world standpoint, a right to be offended at that person? Absolutely. Like, that's rude. You could have at least just been like, hey, I mean, something or a wave or something. But just, I mean, acted like I wasn't as invisible to this person. And again, I kind of even looked around like, okay, like, it was just us. There was obviously nothing to distract this person. Uh, this person just flat out ignored me. And it hurt. I'm not going to lie and say that it didn't affect me. It affected me. But I had an opportunity at that point to do something. And that was either to take offense at that person's actions or to let it go. And again, it's not the easiest thing to do. And it, I, it doesn't just happen automatically. You gotta work at this. But you need to let it go so that it doesn't build up. Because what I don't want to happen is over time, I don't want the next time I see that person to respond the way that they responded no. to me. I don't ever want it to build up to be the point to be like, well, they ignored me, so the next time I see them, I'm going to ignore them. I don't, I don't want to be that person. Right? Again, that's the devil's territory. We've got to rise above those things. My family, my parents, I don't know how many times we've been walking through the mall. And, and when you work in the ministry and you work at church, you work with people, and not everyone leaves on good terms. Some people do, and it's great to see what God's doing in their lives in other places. But some people leave an offense. And you can always tell when they leave an offense because of how they respond to you the next time you see them. I don't know how many times my parents have had that exact thing happen to them. We could be walking down the mall and people just flat out ignore them. Like make eye contact, like totally know they see them. And just one time my mom said the person, you know, totally like went to the other side of the mall hallway to walk past them, right? It happens. And you know, just because we're in the ministry doesn't make us you know, exclusive in this. We've all had people do things like this to us, right? It happens to all of us. And we have an opportunity to either hold on to it, let it fester on the inside of us, or we have an opportunity to let it go. So in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 38, in the New King James, it says, and this is Jesus talking, and this is you know, his first major sermon on the earth. Like, this is him saying, hey, everybody, here I am. Here's what I want to tell you. This is where we see the Beatitudes and all of this. And this is, this is Jesus talking. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Do you hear that? Not resist an evil person. Don't resist them. It says, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. That it's tough to do. Now, I've never physically been slapped on the cheek. <laughs> but the last thing <laughs> that I would ever want to do is be like, you know, go ahead right there too. <laughs> Who's going to do that, right? 
Nobody's going to do that. But what Jesus is saying is people are going to hurt you. People are going to do things that upset you. People are going to do things that make you angry. And what are we supposed to do? Retaliate? No, we don't do that. Now, I'm not saying to put yourself in abusive situations. You all understand that, right? But what I am saying is people are going to do things that aren't going to be kind. We've all had it happen. If you've lived on this earth for any amount of time, you've had it happen. You see your kids going through it at school, right? Things happen, but we're not supposed to retaliate. We're not supposed to then go and start talking bad about them or start, you know, we need to love them as Jesus loved the people who did those things to him. In fact, in the message translation, just part of that scripture says, and if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. Woo, if someone takes unfair advantage of you, Jesus says, be a servant to that person. That's tough. Now again, this is like Jesus' first sermon on the earth. And he's talking to these people and he's saying things like this. <laughs> That would have rocked their world to hear that, right? Because they lived in kind of a brutal society. I mean, the Romans at that time, they were not gracious people to the Jews. And yet he's telling them, hey, if this happens, you need to be a servant to them. You need to love them. You need to turn the other cheek. It's not easy to do. Do you know we're supposed to be that way today too? And we have it easier than they had it back then. We do. And yet, we're, how many of us are retaliating on social media, right? Or texting someone saying, oh, guess what this person just did, right? Or maybe being rude back to them. You know, we've got to be like Jesus. So think about the life of Jesus. Think about him. He, everywhere he went preaching, what did he have? He had the religious people constantly questioning him, constantly interrupting him. All of his motives, all of, the, when he would, physically heal people, they were questioning that, right? He would be speaking and they would bring situations in like the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and just say, hmm, what are you going to do about this? Could you imagine if pastor was up here preaching and that people constantly said, whoa, whoa, wait, pastor, hang on a second, you know, or what about this situation here? Or just brought someone in and said, okay, but you tell me, what would you do in that situation? I mean, Jesus had this happen to him all the time. All the time this was happening to him. And did he ever lash out at them? No. If he spoke, he spoke in love. He spoke the truth in love. It's okay to speak the truth if you're doing it from a place of love. But don't say you are, but on the inside, you really know that you're not walking in love with them and get back on social media, right? Or texting someone. You know, I don't know how many times I myself have found myself talking about a situation. But am I really sharing it out of a heart of love for this person? Or do I really just on the inside want someone to know about what happened? Right? We got to follow the example that Jesus laid for us. I never see, you know, him wanting to ever retaliate against someone, even though he was 100% always in the right and everyone else was in the wrong. I don't see him having to justify his actions. What, why? Because he was about his father's business. He had a job to do. And so he kept his eyes focused on what he was called to do. If we would just keep our eyes focused, stay in our lane, stay focused on what has God called me to do, you know, that. You know, how am I supposed to treat my spouse? Not how is the spouse supposed to treat me? How am I supposed to be on the job? Not how should my boss be treating me, right? All of these situations. How am I a better family member to my family, whether my family's good back to me or not? This is how we have to be focused on, is what has God called me to do? Who's he called me to be? Who's he called me to serve? We all should live the servant life. Jesus did. He was the greatest servant that we've ever had an example of on this earth. This is how we're supposed to be. So if you're ever questioning a situation and someone just does something and you're like, oh, how should I respond? Just look at Jesus. It's in there. Look at how he responded in situations. And, and be real with those situations. Picture yourself in the middle of that situation. Sometimes we read the story you know, of Jesus in these situations and we just kind of read it from like a bubble like perspective. Get in it with him. What do you think it was like when someone just said that to him? or when they just brought that person before him. You know, what were those situations like? He is our best example. We're supposed to follow him in everything he did. So look at him in that. All right, so number one again was let it go. Everyone say let it go. go. All right, number two is shut your mouth. Everyone say shut your mouth. Do you know sometimes we just need to shut our mouths? 
Because when that opportunity to get offended comes inside of us, what do we want to do? What does human nature say? Just, I got to say something about it, right? So turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Oh, this is a fun one. So again, what's another opportunity that we've all had to be offended? Maybe someone's lied about you, right? Maybe someone said something that just wasn't true. Has that ever happened to anybody in here? Absolutely, right? So in Proverbs chapter 6, we get to, to see a little bit of, of a part of God that we don't see too often. And this is talking about the things that God hates. Did you know God hates some things? He doesn't hate the people who do these things, right? But there are some things that he despises. There's something that is an abomination to God. And I'm going to be honest with you, I think we've all fallen into this category of what's been an abomination to him. And we need to watch ourselves. All right, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19 says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, the seventh one is an abomination to him. So here they are. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. And then here it is. This is the abomination one who sows discord among brethren. God despises it when we gossip. That's what that means. Yep. Gossip. Everyone say gossip. gossip. Okay, we think, oh, sowing discord among the brethren is this huge, you know, like, you know, thing. It's gossip. It's talking bad about someone. God doesn't like it. He doesn't just hate it. He considers this an abomination. And this is something all of us have been guilty of one time or another. It happens. What do we need to do? We need to stop it from happening. Because why? When, and maybe, again, you're justified in, in what someone did to you. So you just think, well, I'm just going to tell someone about that. No. Again, as children of God, we have this amazing opportunity to be totally different from the world. And how are we different from the world? We don't respond out of our flesh. We respond out of the God nature that's on the inside of us. That same love is in each of us that's been shed abroad in our hearts. It's in each and every one of us. And so we have an opportunity as children of God. How are we going to respond in these situations? Are we going to respond out of our God nature or out of our flesh? You know, the Bible says, by this one thing, the world will know that we're his disciples. Just this one thing. It's not the signs and wonders that are happening in our churches. It's not through incredible worship experiences. It's not through the word being preached. No. Are all those things good? Do we need all those things? Absolutely. Do you know what the one thing it says? By this thing, all men will know that we're his disciples. It's our love for one another. It's our love for the brethren. Can you see why God calls this an abomination to sow discord among the brethren? Because he wants the world to see him. Right. He wants the world to see his goodness and see his love. And he says how that's going to happen is by us loving each other, not by us sowing discord. This is a big deal to God. And this is how a lot of offense gets started and keeps building is because we don't keep our mouth shut. You know, again, if you look at Jesus, when he was in the court of the Sanhedrin and they had false witnesses coming against him and they had people lying about him, what did Jesus do? Absolutely nothing. He, he just stood there and let them talk. He kept his mouth shut. He kept his mouth shut. And you say, but I just, but I just got to, I just got, Jesus had every right, right to say, hold up a second. That is not true. And I've got people who can come in here and say that is absolutely not true. Could he have performed some signs and wonders in that courtroom? Absolutely he could have. He didn't. He kept his mouth shut. Why? Because he knew he needed to take that punishment. You know, he's our example. There's going to be times you may have every right to say, hang on a second. That is not how it happened. Let me tell you my side of it. And you may be 100% right in your side. But there are going to be times you got to keep your mouth shut. Why? Because people are watching. People are watching. you got to be the bigger person. As a child of God, that's what you're called to do, is to be the bigger person in these situations. And you may be totally justified in it. But look to Jesus. Jesus was 100% justified to be able to speak up, and he kept his mouth shut. 
I don't know of anybody on this earth who's gone through as much as he went through, and yet he never retaliated. He didn't lash out. He didn't get angry at them. What? He kept his mouth shut. Why? Because he knew in the end, God would take care of it. We got to trust God. Trust him that he'll take care of these things. When we've been wronged, trust him that he'll take care of us. Amen? So how do we keep from becoming offended? All right, I'm going to close with this. So how do we keep from it? Because there's going to be times when offense tries to come. And so this first point kind of goes along with let it go. But again, it's, it's just refuse to hold on to these little things. Right. Refuse to keep a hold of them. Let them go. Refuse to allow them to stay inside of you because those little things, as they pile on and pile on and pile on, what happens? They become big. And that's when the blow up happens, right? That's when the marriage is in trouble. That's when you may be tempted to leave your church. That's when maybe you're tempted to never speak to your family ever again. It's because you've let all these little things just keep building up and building up. So refuse to hold on to the little things. You know, it always frustrates me when I hear about or I see, or even how society shows that. For some reason, we think in our homes, we have the right to treat the people who we love the most the worst to just say whatever we want to say and just do whatever we want to do. You know, I see people who hold their tongue all the time when it's their boss, but yet with their spouse, they just say it all. That is not okay. Our home should be the happiest homes. We should not be opening up the door at all for any kind of offenses to happen in our home. Our home should be the safe place. The way you speak to your spouse, you should be the kindest to your spouse than anybody else on this earth, to your kids. Your home should be at peace. And so many times the home is where strife is, it's where hurt is, it's where pain is, and that's not okay. Again, that's the enemy's tactic. So I I wanna challenge you. Make your home the most peaceful environment in any of your your places that you go to. And if you have to have worship music playing 24 seven, even when you're gone, so when you come home, that peace is just already filling up the atmosphere, it's real. It's real and it works. If you have to do that, do that. Don't ever let your kids grow up in a home of chaos, a home of strife, a home of offense. Don't let it happen. You set the tone in your home. Be kind to each other. Love each other, right? It is so important, you guys. And the enemy's just, he's just loving it, what he's able to do in these homes and in these relationships. He wants to cause that offense. He wants to cause that division to happen. A house that's divided against itself, what? It won't stand. We got to watch out for this tactic. So refuse to hold on to the little things. Second, read 1 Corinthians 13 every day. And in my notes underneath that, I put, seriously, I mean it. I mean it. How many times have we heard it? And how many of us are doing it? Read 1 Corinthians 13 every single day. It will keep you from allowing offense in. It will. It's the word. It works. It's living. It's powerful. It's able to change you from the inside out. Do it. Do it. Read 1 Corinthians 13 every day. And number three, stay filled with the Spirit. And if you, I don't have time to go into that, but if you listen to some of the first few messages of this year, Pastor talked about it. Be filled with the Spirit. Because if you're being filled with the Spirit, He's going to give you that little warning of like, don't say that, or let it go. Like I told you, Holy Spirit, He's the one who showed me when He said the guys, right? It was like, Because my flesh was already past the point of listening to that, right? But the Holy Spirit on the inside of me said, hey, did you hear that? He's going to help you in these areas. So stay filled with the Spirit. So I just want to close with this. You know, the enemy's doing everything he can to separate us. Because what happens with, with division, what happens with separation, is you get isolated, And let me tell you, Christians, we were not created to live this life isolated from one another. Because if you get isolated, you're weak. We're stronger together. But if the enemy can isolate you, if he can pull you out of those relationships, those divine connections that God's put you in, then you're on his turf. You need to make sure that you are rising above. Be the bigger person. I know it's easy to just say that, but when the situation happens, 
When push comes to shove, what are you going to do? You need to rise above. And if you read 1 Corinthians 13, and if you're staying filled with spirit, it's going to be a lot easier to do these things. I'm not asking you to do something out of the natural, because guess what? You can't. Right. We can't do this in the natural. We don't have the strength behind us to do it. But from a supernatural standpoint, absolutely we can do these things. We can watch out about offense. So again, hear my heart in this. This is that watch out. Maybe you've been struggling in these areas. Maybe not. I don't know. But guess what? A day will come when you will. Because yeah. the opportunity comes to all of us. So would you stand up with me?